Chapter 18. A Refining Influence The value of true refinement cannot be overestimated. Although the world at large is lacking in a real appreciation of its worth, many people who are highly educated have little, if any, real refinement. The refining influence of life comes from within, but it expresses itself through every spoken word, kindly look, or generous act. A gentleman is not such because of birth, education, position, or money. For the combination of air, these would not necessarily make a gentleman of anyone. To refine is to make pure, to eliminate the dross. And the gentleman is made through the refining and the purifying of his own nature. It is a process of being, a state of becoming. While true refinement comes from within, nevertheless there is much in man's external world that may be used as a means to stimulate this inner growth. Intercourse with refined people and an effort to see the beautiful in nature or in art. It might seem, at first sight, that refinement acquired in this way would prove only of a superficial nature, a veneering that simulates rather than something real. To a degree this may be true, for one may begin with imitation, but any effort expended even in this way helps to call out potential qualities that are resident in all people. So outer things may become rungs in the ladder of progress by which we mount to higher states. All the beauty, rhythm, and harmony we are able to perceive in our outer environment acts on us somewhat like a magnet to call out or to attract the living melody, rhythm, and harmony that lie within, and when the inner is awakened, then we perceive still greater beauties without, so that the outer acts on the inner, and the inner on the outer to produce an ever-expanding life. Often there is a very real development going on in life so gradually that the person may be all unconscious of its taking place, and even when he becomes conscious that such development has been going on, he may find it difficult to account for. One may listen to a wonderful musical composition without apparently being affected by it, but through coming in contact with others and listening to opinions expressed by them about the composition, the next time he hears it he brings something more to it than he did at first and becomes conscious of a beauty of melody and harmony that he was unable to perceive in the first place. Intercourse and exchange of ideas with people tend to enlarge our mental vision. Sympathetic understanding on our part will call out sympathetic understanding from others. Constant interchange of thought and sympathy with others aids much not only in bringing about true relationship with other people, but also in helping to develop our lives. Illumination comes from within. But the outer thing may be the match that serves to light the lamp that is within. So, at times, even the little things in one's outer life speak to and call out the inner thought and feeling. The refining process of life becomes one of daily desire and effort. Desire to know and effort to do. In it knowing and doing are inseparably linked, as all knowledge that is acquired is intended to be put to some definite use. Refinement comes through a constant effort to give expression to one's ideals. Now the ideal is always ahead of one's performance, but through the effort one makes to give expression to it, the ideal goes on enlarging, and because of this one need not excuse oneself by saying that if one knew better one would do better. For knowing comes through doing. He who does the best he knows will never lack in knowledge for still better doing. There are many little courtesies and kindnesses that we appreciate in others, but often fail to cultivate in ourselves. I do not think that we should expect from anyone else that which we refrain from giving or are unwilling to give. If one gives of the best one has to give, the giving becomes a magnet, as it were, to draw out the best from others. It is through giving that one receives. The more one can bring to life, the more one will get from life in return. The smile on one's face will bring the smile to the face of another. The harsh word will call out resentment and be followed by harshness in return. We are so actively engaged in all the externals of life that we become forgetful of the highest self. If people could be made to understand that it is through knowledge of the subjective or inner life that they become best fitted to live the outer, then they would pay far more attention to the development of their inner lives than they do at the present. Let me illustrate it in this way. A man is anxious to do as much work and get as great return from that work as it is possible for him to get. He applies himself in a diligent way, but after a time he finds that he is either so mentally or physically tired that it is only with the greatest effort that he can continue his work. If he keeps on making such effort, eventually there comes a nervous or physical breakdown, and for the time being he becomes incapacitated for further work 
and perhaps during that time all the material means he worked so hard to gain are lost to him. This is a very common experience in life. Now, if such a man could know that there are easier and better methods, both in thinking and in working, so that he could accomplish as much work with half the expenditure of energy and get the same result, then he would be very foolish not to employ such methods. The writer is assured beyond the possibility of a doubt that one can not only acquire a better and easier way of doing everything, but also be always in possession of a reserve energy and therefore ready to meet any unusual emergency. But one can only succeed in doing this through an understanding of the innate powers and possibilities of one's own inner life. There is a natural way of living, and if we follow this way, we shall never have any reason to regret it. If we desire greater health and strength in order to do the work we have to do in life, then such desire is the first step toward bringing us the fulfillment. Whenever we desire with heart and mind at one, we create a magnet to attract to us the object of our desire. Man's prayers are not intended to please God, but to bring his own life into right relationship both with the source of life and his outer environment. When we enter the secret place of the Most High, we do not do so in order to bring gifts to God, but rather to put ourselves in right relation to Him, so that we may receive gifts from Him. This inner life, then, is the real source of supply. The outer life is the plane of demand. In order to keep the source of supply open for the influx of every good and every perfect gift, we must have the inner rhythm united with melody, in order that the mind may be illumined by visions of ideal beauty. For the soul of man may be likened to a harp on which all the divine emotions make music. Music can be made to sing through the life of man and bring with it new revelations, not only of the deepest, but of the highest things of life. And from this inner revelation there will come not only a refining influence on the whole life, but such a radiance as will enable the life to impart to the lives of others something of its own joy and brightness. When man's inner life is made to sing, then all his outer work is expressed through rhythm and harmony, and there is not only an ease in doing his work, but a real pleasure. One who is not experienced does not and cannot realize the pleasure and joy that come through doing real creative work. Creative work consists in the divine vision or ideal taking form in mind and being followed by the effort on the part of the one who has received it to give outer expression or form to the inner ideal. One never tires of such work. There is no undue haste or loss of energy because, where rhythm, melody, and harmony are being truly expressed in action, there can be no mental or physical tension and therefore no useless expenditure of energy. In listening to music or poetry, one should endeavor rather to feel their beauty than try to use the mind in thinking about it, because such listening, in order to serve its true purpose, should awaken the inner feeling. In the development of the life of man, everything external to himself, should be used simply as a means to an end for the full and complete expression of his own life. Some might claim that such a proceeding would end in extreme selfishness, but just. The reverse of this is true, said Pope. God loves from whole to part, but human souls must rise from individual to the whole. Self-love, but serves the virtuous mind to wake, as the small pebble stirs the peaceful lake. It is only through self-development that a man can come into right relation with his fellow man. It is only through soul development that the self at last comes into conscious relationship with the source of being from whence it took its rise. There is what might be termed an unconscious selfishness where the self seems solely engaged in its own preservation. This is one of the necessary stages in life, because the one who has never cared for himself cannot come to care for any other self since everything must begin with the self and work from that self outward. The part, as it were, reaches out to establish at one mint with the whole. Through learning how to care for and protect oneself there later comes the power to care for and protect others. Selfishness and unselfishness are varying degrees of the same thing. The first is personal desire for happiness, pleasure, and self-protection. Later this is all used for the happiness, pleasure, and protection of others. If one had never lived the former part of it, one could never know how to live the latter part of it. In the grand economy of nature, nothing is ever lost. Everything fulfills some purpose. What we call our lower nature is only the laying of the foundation for something that is larger and more enduring. But from first to last it is all necessary, and consequently, it is all good. Because each individual man is a member or part of humanity, 
it follows that whatever makes for his highest and best good must also be working through his life for the good of others. Because no man lives unto himself, his feelings, thoughts, spoken words, and his actions all exert an influence upon his fellow men. The kind of influence he exerts is solely dependent on what he himself is. If his life is filled with melody and harmony, then he is showing a way of escape to those whose lives are monotonous and discordant. While each person is of necessity bound to work out his own salvation, yet the value of the light and help that may come from another life is almost incalculable. We may not carry the burdens of others, but we may lighten those burdens through showing them easier and better ways of carrying them. The person, then, who is trying to purify and refine his own life is aiding the world at large probably as much as he could in any other way. Later there will come a stage where he will lose all concern for his personal will, where he will concentrate his time and attention on feeling, thinking, and caring for others. That time comes only when a man becomes conscious that he is at one with God and his fellow man. The part becomes, as it were, merged in the whole, the personal will becomes displaced by the universal and the man is consciously cooperating with God. The question often arises in the mind of an individual as to how he can best cultivate his mind and develop his life. And too often he makes the mistake that such cultivation can only be attained through what might be called materialistic ways and means which give no lasting returns. I know that many people will take exception to the advice or suggestion I am about to give, saying that if they were followed out they would unfit the man or woman for practical, everyday living. Now I know that there are two sides to life, the side that should be thoroughly idealistic and another side that should be as thoroughly practical. But I assert that there should exist no antagonism between the two, that true idealism should always be expressed in a thoroughly practical way, that the idealistic life is not necessarily made up of dreams that can never be realized, but rather of visions of things that are to be. The world could never make any progress if it were not constantly receiving new ideals. Therefore. In the truest sense of the word, it is not the layers of brick or the hewers of wood who are the creators of the world's beautiful, artistic buildings, but the architect who first wrought out the structure in his own mind. Were it not for the inner vision the world would perish. An early English poet wrote, My mind to me a kingdom is, such present joys therein I find, that it exacts all other bliss that earth affords or grows by kind. Now, if the mind is devoid of beauty of thought, there can be no beauty of expression. If we are to enter into the enjoyment of our own minds, then the inner must necessarily be filled with something for us to enjoy. I have said this by way of preface for what follows. A person may be so busily engaged in his everyday work that he may not have very much time to give to anything outside of it, but if he can do his work more easily and better because of giving some little time to the improvement of his mind, and if he is to find satisfaction and joy in his own mind, then he must be willing to devote as much time as he can in order to obtain the best results. He should cultivate the love of music, and he should cultivate his singing voice preferably to some musical instrument. If he can cultivate both, so much the better. He should learn to discriminate between good and indifferent music, and never select the poorest when he can have the best. I do not mean to say that the person who is just taking up music should become absorbed in the classical or higher order of music, but there are many degrees, or, we might say, planes of music, where even the most simple music may be good or indifferent. Select, then, the best music of its kind, whether for the voice or instrument. Remember that music is the greatest power in the world to awaken the inner emotions, and not merely the elemental passions of life. Try to feel its rhythm and melody within the self, then seek to give expression to it. And so far as you are able, make the life musical, and the mind will become stored up with delightful memories of the music you have listened to. After music read the greatest poets, next to the composer of music comes the composer of verse. In a lesser way, he may be said to be putting the things of the spirit into tangible form. The writer can remember times in life, many years ago, when, feeling despondent or gloomy, he could take up one of the great poets and become so thoroughly absorbed in reading that after fifteen or twenty minutes he would find all the gloom and despondency dispelled. The reading of the poetry was, in fact, a mental treatment that made for a healthier and brighter outlook on life. The poet, too, like the composer, is very close to the soul of life and is able to interpret something of the joy and gladness, 
something of the faith and hope that live eternally in the soul. In other words, it is the composer of music and the composer of verse that help to bring us in closest relation to the soul of healing. People cannot make a study of one or the other without its having a direct action upon their inner lives to call out more of sweetness and light, to act as a refining influence upon the external life. Thus we not only lay the foundation for a beautiful life in the present, but are storing up the riches that shall last when this present life is no more. For as we brought nothing in the way of material things into this world, so when we leave it, we take nothing with us save the love and wisdom we have acquired while here in this world. This constitutes our real capital of life, no matter where we are. There are some people who never like to be alone. They are constantly craving companionship or excitement of one kind or another. It makes them lonely and nervous to be left by themselves. This condition illustrates lack of culture. They have failed to develop their own minds, consequently can feel no companionship with their inner thoughts and feelings, and without excitement or company they are at a loss to know what to do with themselves. Again, other people may so enjoy the companionship of their own thoughts and ideals that it becomes almost in the nature of a recreation to them to be left, for a season, to themselves. Everyone should know how much his own happiness is dependent upon real communion with his inner self and how much his outer life requires of this inner self in order to make that outer as perfect as the inner. The supreme object of life is to develop the whole man, soul, mind, and body to purify and refine the whole life. It is not a question of development in one direction or another, but an all-around development that affects the whole man. There is within us a higher consciousness than that consciousness which consists of the world and the things of the world. Through this cultivation we come at last to recognize that heaven is a condition of mind, that the kingdom of God lives in us, that we possess it and are possessed by it. Potentially, every human being has this kingdom within himself, but many are unaware of it. They are lacking in true consciousness concerning it. There are many steps leading up to its discovery. We may use many things as aids to help us in the way of attainment, to bring light to enlighten our way. Music and poetry can be made to unlock the gates of heaven, so that the inner glory and radiance are mirrored by the mind, and the whole life is quickened and renewed. Through the constant use of music and poetry, there come new visions and a new outlook upon all life. Everything in the outer is translated into terms of beauty. We see, hear, and feel nature through her rhythm of melody and harmony. There comes, as it were, a new appreciation of nature, so that while we see an infinity of diversity of forms and an infinite variety of beauty, yet we have the consciousness that all the variety and diversity are necessary to one complete whole that all are but parts of one stupendous whole, whose body nature is and God the soul. It is in this way that life takes on new meaning and that the mind, instead of being filled with the strain and stress of living, becomes optimistic and buoyant. It is in reality a new birth wherein everything seems as though it were made new, and the individual who has found such a life and knows that he is a part of it will consciously ever after seek to keep his life in accord with all inner and outer life. If we desire to refine and make our lives harmonious as well as beautiful, we should be willing to take the one way that will give us not only the surest and the most direct, but the best results. A worldly-minded person might say that the following out of such a course would be fatal to what he calls success in life. But success is not measured half so much by what a man has in the way of possessions as by what a man is in the way of development. Life cannot be measured by things that are temporary by things which change and pass away. Life can only be measured by the things which endure. Material possessions are for the moment. Spiritual and mental possessions are for eternity. Worldly ambition too often stands in the way of true success. For what shall it profit a man, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We may have worldly riches and yet, in passing from this world and entering into another, we may find ourselves in a state of real poverty, lacking everything necessary to real life and living. The real riches of life must be acquired sometime and somewhere. So why defer the day? Why not see that the present time is the accepted time? Why not lay up treasure while it is today and prepare the way for a still greater life and a still greater happiness in the time to come?
For the truly successful life is the one which by its own fullness of love and wisdom is able to impart love and wisdom to others. End of chapter.